Today, a topic rarely discussed, how does God discipline his children? Hi, I'm David Servant, and this is Heavenward TV. Well, God bless you, and thank you so much for joining me one more time as we continue our chronological study through the entire New Testament. And we're uh, finishing out the book of James, but today I, I want to hone in on a couple of verses in chapter 5 that we've already touched on, but uh, there's more here that needs to be said. We need to dig a little bit deeper, primarily because it's such an important subject that uh, we're going to be talking about, one that I rarely hear talked about, and yet uh, it's so biblical, it's so applicable to your life and my life that we need to be biblically educated on this subject. And that is the subject of God's discipline in the life of followers of Jesus Christ. This all started when we read a couple of verses in James chapter 5, namely verses 9 and verse number 12. Let's read verse 9 first. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. So the complainer, uh, one who complains against other Christians, is in danger of being judged. And obviously, that's a negative thing. Something negative happens to the person who's judged by the Lord, right? Right, okay. And then we jump down just three verses to verse number 12. Above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under judgment. So here's the second warning that James gives to fall followers of Christ, uh, that they could stand in danger of judgment if they're not letting their yes be yes and their no be no. Something, of course, that Jesus Christ himself taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus also taught about not judging lest we be judged. Judge not lest ye be judged. And so James is really just reiterating what Jesus has said and making the same warning that Christ said that uh, sadly, Christians ignore that or explain it away, and, and so thankfully we've got it here in James to reiterate it and make us stop and think about it for a second, okay? So point number one, Christians could be judged for sins of their tongue, and certainly uh, James has had a lot to say about that to his contemporary readership and uh, because there was a lot of sinning going on from people's mouths, and that's why James has so much to say about it to all the Christians who had been scattered abroad early on in the church's history. And now he's telling them that if you don't clean up your act, you stand in danger of something negative happening. God judging you. God, you know, allowing something to happen or doing something that you're not going to enjoy. You're not going to like. And, and and the idea is God's, God disciplines all those whom he loves, we're told in several places of scripture. And uh, so God's trying to get us back on track. He wants to get us to where he can pour out his blessing on us and not have to be correcting us through judgment or discipline. I'm using those words uh, synonymously. Okay, and so then as we progressed in James chapter 5, we came to the very next verse, verse 13. James asks, are you suffering? Pray. You're cheerful. Sing praises. Then the next verse, verse 14, is any among you sick? And here, you know, in that context of the, of the, the warnings of the dangers of God's judgment for sins of the tongue, uh, we see that very clearly that that judgment could come in the form of sickness, okay? Let's read it closely. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. So that's a, you know, a, a universal promise to anyone among the churches who are sick. James clearly uh, views sickness as undesirable. And I think most people view sickness that way, except a few theologians. God, God bless them. And... He presents it as abnormal within the church. Wow. Now, I've been in church services where we had, uh, you know, an invitation, people who wanted prayer for healing, and every single person came forward. I mean, goodness gracious, there's a lot of sickness, and there's reasons for that beyond what we're just reading here, but there's a lot of sickness in, a, in, in our country where we've got a great health care system for the most part by comparison to so many countries of the world, and, and uh, you know, great information on health and nutrition and exercise and all that stuff that other countries don't have, and yet we're just, you know, this is like almost universal sickness. 
Okay, and, and so James viewed it as undesirable, really not even normal, something that ought to not be among the church. Well, you think about it. Listen to this. God said under the old covenant, you know, if you will keep my commandments and, and walk in my statutes, so he says, I'll take sickness out of the midst of you and the number of days, your days, I will fulfill. So they're, they're promised divine health, uh, you know, and uh, length, of, uh, length of life, longevity. That's under the old covenant. We've got a better covenant established on better promises, yet everybody's sick. <laughs> you know, I don't know. That's, I'm just not satisfied, okay? And, and so James goes on and says, you know, the, the, the Lord will restore the one who's sick, raise him up. And now listen to the second clause in James 5.15. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. And so all in one package, in one incident, in one prayer, James is talking about getting healed from sickness through the prayer of faith of the elders of the church, and at the same time receiving forgiveness of sin. And again, it's not implicitly stated, but I think it's strongly implied here. You know, looking at the context, he's just been talking about the dangers of judgment. We know, as we talked about last time in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verses 27 through about 30, Paul made it so clear that God's judgment or discipline can come in the form of weakness, sickness, and premature death. And so this collaborates perfectly with that. James is saying, hey, some of you guys are sick. You don't need to be sick. Get the prayer of faith going, and you may need to confess some sins. In fact, he goes on to say in verse 16, Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. And so there's a connection according to the holy word of God. God, and not just in this place, but other places between sickness uh, and sin and repentance and healing. Wow, how about that? So it all fits together. And I want to provoke you to begin to think about this, okay? And not that I'm asking you to drag something up in your life to say, well, I don't know what I've done wrong that God would be judging me for that. Well, no, but listen to your mouth. You know, are there sins of the tongue? Complaining, judgment, you know, all that kind of stuff. Well, we're going to talk about this more next time. i got more to say. Be right back. You know, something I love about biblical truth is that if it is true, it's true all over the Bible. And the most dangerous Bible interpreter is the one who like takes one scripture and says, oh, I've got a scripture for my doctrine, you know, to prove it. If it's true and if it's important, it's all over the Bible. And we're talking right now as we study through the book of James uh, in James chapter 5, uh, focusing for a little bit on the subject of the judgment of the Lord on Christians. And that's a biblical phrase and a biblical idea. It could also say the discipline of the Lord, either one of those. It's when God is not happy about something in our lives and and he's you know been speaking to us by his word and by his spirit, but we're not paying attention. And so God says, well, I got to go to plan B here. And so he'll allow some circumstance, something negative, something you or I are not going to like to get our attention. You know, And maybe one of the purest ways to do that is to allow us to find our Ourselves sick in some way, and that is entirely biblical. You can find examples in the Bible of God disciplining or judging people through sicknesses, through disease, and even through premature death. It's from cover to cover, okay? And uh, so Christians who poo-poo this or deny it, I mean, you're missing it entirely. And, and, and some Christians are so focused on the love of God and we're the righteousness of God in Christ. And, and holiness has be, is not even a factor, it seems, in their Christian lives where the Bible from cover to cover is just a book about holiness and how to please God. And you say, oh, no, no, I thought Jesus was a sinner. Well, of course, Jesus is a sinner person of the Bible, but what's the whole point of Jesus coming to earth? He came to the earth to die for our sins so we could be reconciled reconciled to God and so that we, we could so that we could be filled with the spirit and live holy lives okay and and so you know if, if you go to a church and you don't hear, hear sermons on a regular basis that are somehow tied into the subject of God's holiness find a new church I mean you are in the wrong place
You know, because look at the Bible, how much information is there about God's expectations for us. It's all a, it's a book about how to live our lives. So if we're not in line with God's word, well, then we're in danger of making him unhappy. And if he's unhappy, he's going to love us and try to correct us and get us back onto that narrow road. And so something negative will happen. And sickness is one of those things. And we've been seeing that from James chapter 5. Because James tells us, is any among you sick? Call for the elders. The prayer of faith will restore him. And if you've committed any sins, it will be forgiven him. And then this this verse, James 5 and verse number 16, therefore confess your sins one to another and pray for one another. So it's not just the elders having to pray for the sick. It's uh, any of us can pray for the sick. Jesus said the, this is one of the signs that will fall the believers. They'll lay hands upon the sick and they will recover. It's scriptural for everyone who's a believer in Christ to pray for the sick. Confess your sins to one another, pray for one another so that you may be healed. And so there is a connection between sickness and sin and health and healing and repentance and obedience. Okay, so, so what should we do when we find ourselves sick or if we find ourselves consistently sick with some ailing problem? Well, let's look for the source. Let's look for the reason. And uh, yeah, there could be other reasons beside, you know, God's discipline in our lives, but that's something to consider. Okay. Um, you know, and the first place I would look at is I would look at what's coming out of my mouth, because that's exactly what James made reference to in James chapter 5. The two things he warns that we might be judged for by the judge are complaining against one another, you know, fault finding and so forth, and not being honest with our words, having little bits of guile and exaggeration and lies within our language. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, that you may not fall under judgment, James said in verse number 12 of chapter 5. Okay? So that's the first place I look. If you you are a consistently negative, fault-finding, fault-speaking person, always looking for the bad in everybody. Well, you, you ought to seriously, you know, do a checkup from the neck up. You know, and get rid of your stinking thinking and get rid of your, you know, clean up your mouth. You know, and start looking for the good in people and what you can say that's good about them. James earlier on said, how is it that we bless God and then curse men who are created in his image? See, that's a, that's a contradiction. So if we love God, we're going to love people. That doesn't mean we approve of people. That doesn't mean that we don't realize that some people are doing wrong. But there's those people who are always finding fault and always verbalizing it. It just shows they, they think that they're, they're qualified to be the judge of everybody because they're perfect. And so God hates pride. God humbles the pride. Out, you got my drift, okay? Now, uh, can I just refer you to another verse of Scripture in 1 Peter uh, chapter 3? I'm not going to have time to get all the way through this, but we'll hit it next time. Um, but listen to one of the f summarizing statements in Peter's first epistle. To sum up, this is verse 8 of chapter 3. Let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Well, those are all things that relate to our relationships with others and what we say to them, say about them, and how what we do with them. Harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit. You got that? Okay, let's keep reading. Not returning evil for evil. So if someone's rotten to us, we shouldn't be getting our revenge. Or insult for insult. Now he's talking about what comes out of our mouth. People insult us. Does that give us the right to insult them back? Well, no, we're supposed to have pure tongues and, and loving hearts. But giving a blessing instead, well, isn't that what Jesus taught? Bless those who curse you. Bless and curse not. You know, I mean, we're supposed to return good for evil. And, uh, and that's something that comes out of our mouth. Uh, for you are called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For, now he quotes from the Old Testament, let him whom, listen closely, listen closely to this. Let him who means to love life and see good days. Is that what you want? You want to love life and see good days? Here's what you need to do. Refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. There's that honesty thing again, and there's that uh, purity thing again. What comes out of her mouth? And the, the antithesis of that, of course, is, you know, if you're not going to restrain your tongue from evil, if you're not going to restrain your lips from speaking guile, then you're not going to enjoy loving life and seeing good days. Wow. This is so important, okay? 
I've got more to say even yet about this, all right? Be right back. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we know what's inside of people by what comes out their mouth. And when we use that old religious Christian cliche, well, we don't know what's in their hearts and we don't want to judge them. No, well, actually we do know what's in their hearts if we listen closely to what comes out their mouths, all right? So before we listen to what comes out of other people's mouths, let's listen to what's coming out of our own mouths and uh, see if maybe we need a heart adjustment. Amen, all right? Now, when we left off last time, I was reading in a cross-reference in 1 Peter chapter 3, where Peter is actually quoting, I think it's from Proverbs, I didn't look it up in advance, but I believe it's from Proverbs, and, and giving a, a, you know, a, 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 a means, a, a method, a, a lifestyle that you're going to love your life and you're going to see good days if you'll do these things. And so I'm just going to jump back up to verse number nine, or verse number 10 rather. Let him who means to love life and see good days refrain his tongue. The first thing he mentions is refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. Boy, no wonder James quoted from this because he's, he's really into the sins of the tongue. And let him turn away from evil and do good let him seek peace and pursue it. Okay, so it's not just what we say, it's also our actions. And then verse number 12 of 1 Peter 3, for the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Okay, now this is written to Christians in the context of, of Proverbs as well as in the context of, of 1 Peter. And so obviously Christians could find themselves in the wrong category if they're saying and doing the wrong things. That's why Peter is bringing up this subject. That's why James brings up this subject, okay? Christians are free moral agents. They can be evil. They can say evil things. They can do evil things. Now they have the Holy Spirit within them that's somewhat of a restraint, but he's not a controller. He's not down there you know, pushing buttons of a robot and so that we always do exactly what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. No, no, no. He'll speak to us, but we've got to listen, all right? You can walk after the flesh or walk after the Spirit. That's very clear from the New Testament teaching. So listen up. Listen up to what comes out of your mouth, and, and especially so if you have, you know, been uh, suffering uh, sickness and so forth. Now, um, I want to jump also back, and I touched on this before, but I think it just, you know, we've got four minutes together left, and I just think this is so important, so I'm going to close out in this scripture. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 31. Same theme, okay? Um, and, and actually, I'm going to start with verse number 27. Paul has been writing about the sanctity of the Lord's Supper and how to go about doing it and how the Corinthians were doing it wrong because they weren't showing consideration one to another and they weren't treating it as holy. Therefore, he says in verse 27, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, so there must be some way that we could do it unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Well, that raises it to a pretty high level, doesn't it? Okay, boy, we want to make sure we're not partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner because that makes us like on par with the people that killed Jesus. But let a man examine himself. Whoa, okay? And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we ought to do an examination. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself. That's been our theme. If he does not judge the body rightly, and there are some that teach that you know what what Paul means by that is you haven't discerned that you know Jesus bore your sicknesses and diseases in his body and so forth. I don't think that's what he's saying though because that doesn't fit really contextually at all. You know he's talking about judging, examining yourself, and and confessing your sin and so forth. He's not talking about making sure you grasp a theological doctrine. Uh, keep, keep on reading; it becomes clear. Verse thirty. For this reason, in other words, you're partaking in an unworthy. Manner, manner, and so you're eating and drinking judgment upon yourself. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. So there, I, I, I close the case right now. 
Okay, that's why Christians ought to examine themselves because you don't want to be judged with weakness, sickness, or premature death. How do you escape it? The Lord is merciful. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And so that's the theme that, that Paul picks up on in verse number uh, th uh, 31. But if we judged ourselves rightly, see, we're not judging, you know, a theological concept about Jesus bearing our sins, judging ourselves. If we judged ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. That's how you escape God's judgment. You judge yourself. Oops, oh, Lord, forgive me. I repent. I'm going to get back on track here. Okay? But when we are judged, listen to this, how interesting it is. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. And so there's the love of God in his loving discipline and his loving judgment upon his own people who, are, who are, you know, are, are bent on going the wrong way and don't repent, he says, okay, I'm going to bring you home prematurely because if I didn't bring you home, if I waited, I'd have to condemn you with the world. That is, you know, you'd ultimately go to hell. And of course, people who believe, you know, in once saved, always saved, they have an explanation for that. They have to twist it like they twist all the other scriptures that are so clear, you know, that once saved doesn't mean always saved. It's possible to get off the narrow road and get on the broad low road that leads to destruction and so forth. You're a free moral agent. You can become an adulterer and no adulterer will inherit the kingdom of God. You can become a, a fornicator, a swindler, you know, and all those other kinds of people that Paul emphatically stated repeatedly that they will not inherit God's kingdom. But I don't want to get, get off of that. What I really want to focus on here is to get every one of us to be taking a look at our lives. And if you start saying nice things, I'm not saying to call evil good, but instead of always finding fault with everybody, always finding out what's wrong, let's, you know, uh, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification that it might give grace to those who hear it. That's in Ephesians 4, I think right around verse number 29. That's what God wants to hear coming out of our mouths because that would then reflect a loving heart, a heart that loves neighbor as self and who's really in it for the greater good of everybody. Okay, well, I hope this was uh, edifying and encouraging to you, all right? That's why we're here, and looking forward to seeing you next time as we pick up back in James. Ooh, I'm loving it, all right? Thanks, see you next time. Visit us online at heavenward.tv to view this and every episode of Heavenward TV for free. Watch the behind the scenes videos. Read other teaching articles, books, and devotionals written by David Servant. And learn about other exciting ministries that David directs. All this and more is at heavenward.tv.